Put your hands together. We serve a good God.
Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, as it is in heavens, so shall it be on earth. On the way to your seat this morning, grab three people and tell them, heaven on earth is what we pray for. Good morning, Freedom Center Church. Everybody doing great? Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, let's run for, through a couple of announcements. You know what? Uh, kids are about to go back to school. Some have already gone back. Yeah! It's all the parents, all the parents cheering. Okay. <laughs> and uh, guess what? It's time for home groups to crank back up. Yeah, there you go. Way to go. Yeah. And you know what? We really appreciate the new home group leaders that have stepped up and said uh, we will do a home group. And there will be, for those people, the new home group leaders, there will be a meeting next Sunday, next door, at 9 o'clock. New home group leaders next door, 9 o'clock next Sunday. 
We're also really encouraged by the amount of people that have signed up for the activity groups. Okay, we had a lot of, lot of activity groups and uh, some good sign-ups back there. So remember the table in the back. This is a kind of an extension of the home groups uh, where we get together based on some activities that uh, motorcycle riding, yeah. yeah. God's angels over there, or whatever, I guess. Hallelujah. All right. So sign up in the back for activity groups as well. Also, Young at Heart. This is the Barbara Kersey led group. Going to have, yeah. That's uh, 55 and older, right? Yeah. I think there's a few people that are that in this church. I don't know any, but there got to be. Okay, 55 and older. That's the Young at Heart. They're going to go bowling next Saturday at 10 o'clock at the Stafford Lanes. Okay? Maybe they've got, like, senior citizen balls that are a little lighter. I don't know. I don't know. All right. All right. Never, never mind. Okay. All right. Bowling next Saturday. Does anybody bowl? Okay. All right. Also... We have a real need here in the body for additional ushers, okay? We're calling them, as the Bible does, gatekeepers. So, you know, the Lord calls us, the, the Lord gifts us with different giftings. Some people are gifted in that manner. So, if you would uh, like to participate and be a gatekeeper, Gene Mitchell, who's standing here in the center, We'll be at the back of the church after church today, so please contact him and talk with him. A gatekeeper for the Lord. Amen. Okay, here's something that uh, the women always like. Girls' night out, right? Yeah! <laughs> Woo! Okay, that's going to be not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday. The 27th, Girls' Night Out with uh, Linda Crawford doing, of course, the teaching. Come for the food at 6 and the teaching at 7. All right, Aaron, can you come on up? Yeah. One person likes you, right? Over <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I have a couple of ma announcements that I just want to throw at you, so put on your seatbelts and get ready, or break out your notebooks and remember them. Uh, August 31st. I believe. 30th. I'm sorry. August 30th is our back to school bash. Uh, or more like back in school bash because I know that's already the first week of school. We want to see your kids over there. We're going to have a great time and fun fellowship. I have my leaders getting together. Uh, it's going to be awesome. So I want, all, I want to see all you kids over there. Thank you. <laughs> and also, we're doing something new this, uh, this new school year. We're starting something, some new things over at New Generation. First off, we're taking worship auditions. We're having worship auditions go on. It's going to be throughout this month and next month. So if you have kids that have a musical talent and they just want to express it and worship God, we want to take them. We want to give them that opportunity to express their worship to God. So if you, if you want any more information about that, you can contact me at Aaron. Aaron at freedomcenterchurch.com, or you can talk to Shimon Spencer. He's our worship leader. So we're having worship auditions. So you kids, if you have a talent that you want to show, that you want to give to God, come talk to me. Come talk to Shimon. So not only are we doing worship, but we're also doing drama auditions. We're going to be starting a drama group in our, in our youth group, and it's going to be he headed up by Chelsea Duggar. And we're going to be starting auditions September 8th, September 8th is going to be when we start auditions. I know, I know we put it as August 25th up there, but it's actually going to be September 8th, September 8th. So if you're interested, contact me at, at Aaron at freedomcenterchurch.com. And hope to see all of you guys. I'm excited for this new year. God bless. Amen. Okay, one other thing. Uh, we're going to have water baptism here. Sunday, September 1st. So if you would like to be water baptized, call the church or sign up in the back. Amen. Well, good morning, Freedom Center Church. Oh, come on. You can do a little better than that. Good morning, Freedom Center Church. Woo, I know there's got to be one person in the house who loves the Lord today. Is there one person in the house? Just one. 
Amen. Well, I am charged with welcoming our visitors. If you're visiting with us for the very first or second time, we'd like for you to stand up so we can officially welcome you. If you're here for the very first or second time, please stand up. I see you. Don't sit down yet. No, no. Don't sit down. Don't sit down. Don't sit down. Amen. Please remain standing. We want to officially welcome you to our church this morning. We want to thank you so very much for choosing to worship with us. Uh, our ushers are going to come by in a second. They're going to bring you a gift packet. In that gift packet is a card. We ask that you would complete the card and take that card to the back table underneath the monitor there. And we want to give you a little gift card to go to Chick-fil-A and have a bite on us. And we want to thank you so very much for worshiping with us. We'd like to bless you and your family. And we hope to see you back again real, real soon. Amen. If there's any members nearby, reach over and shake their hand and officially touch them and welcome them. Amen? Are we ready to praise the Lord? Praise I know Pastor Clarence is ready to lay it down. <laughs> Buckle up. Amen. <laughs> to God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may come in praise the lord Defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord.
This is the day you've made, so I will lift my voice and give you praise. This is the day you made, so I will lift my voice and give you praise. For you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. Yes, Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy. You are Lord, when you are glorified, my heart is satisfied to know all praise and honor are yours. And when all creation sings to you, the King of kings, we know all praise and honor. the glory, all the honor, 
all the worship, all the lifted hands, all the praise is spoken from our heart. Lord, they are yours. They don't belong to anybody else. They're not for anybody else. But they are yours, Lord. For you are
Praise be to the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Don, and praise team. That is powerful. Ooh. You may be seated. It's uh, time to take up our tithes and offerings this morning. Uh, ushers, if you would uh, come forward, please, with the collection buckets. And um, for those of you giving cash offerings, the ushers have envelopes so we can make record of your giving. Please raise your hand, and they will uh, get one to you. Uh, this morning, I want to share with you out of uh, uh, First Chronicles. This is uh, King David is addressing the assembly and talking about the giving and the resources that the congregation is bringing to build the temple. And in chapter 29, verse 16 and 17, he says, Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for uh, building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the, test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent, and now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. This is a powerful scripture. There's so much in it. First, David is telling the congregation that it all comes from God and it all belongs to God. And God is actually testing them. He's equating giving to integrity. So when you give back to the Lord, he sees that as integrity and will give you joy for that. So do we want to walk in that joy? Amen. Absolutely. So let's pray over this offering this morning. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to, to give back what belongs to you anyway, Lord. And we just ask that these resources be uh, used to grow your kingdom further, the, the mission uh, of the Freedom Center, Lord. We just uh, thank you for the opportunity of the bridge to reach the community, Lord, uh, for your teaching to, to spread your word, the gospel of your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
next. File, please. Mm -hmm. Some lying, some stealing, and some acts of kindness here and there. I tried to live a good life. Well, let's see how good. This way. Next. Bio, please. Okay, I admit it. I did a lot of bad things. Yes, I see. But I've done good things too, you know, to offset the bad things. Like one time I cheated on a test, but then I cleaned up trash in the park. Mm-hmm. That should balance out, right? Let's find out. This way. That should have balanced out, right? It should have balanced out. Next. Bio, please. Impressive. Oh, yeah. I devoted my entire life to making this world a better place. I dug wells in Africa. I donated blood every month. And I ran an orphanage in India. I mean, I just wish I could have done more. Mm-hmm. And is this your subscription? I only read the articles. I only read the articles! Next. My mom goes to church. I was baptized as a baby? Take American Express, right? Next. File, please. Whoa. Somebody's been busy. Well, let's get this over with. Sorry, um, I didn't know he was with you. Okay, step on the scale. Not you. Him. Hey, wait a minute. That is totally not fair. Yeah. That's why it's called Grace. Next. Wow. Wow, we have a very special young lady. Julia Jamawin is going to sing a song for us this morning. Just lend her your ear.
Amen. Amen. That, uh, that video, uh, David Carnahan had loaned us that video, and I think it let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> this morning I'm going to be uh, bringing a message, the title, Do Good People Go to Heaven? And uh, before I uh, bring the message, I want to pray and ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're the one that's within each one of us here today. You're the one that covers the earth with your presence. You're the one that uh, inspired every letter, every word of the Word of God. And as we come up to the table a blessing, as we partake of the Word this morning, we pray that each one of us who know Jesus Christ will receive your word. And for those of us who do not know Jesus yet, we pray for that revelation of your love, Father, and of what Jesus Christ did for every one of us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, before I read this passage, this opening passage, this is Jesus talking. Uh, he was talking after the seven-year tribulation after the 1,000 millennial reign that he reigned in Jerusalem on David's throne, this is a time in which eternity is about to begin. And we read this in Matthew 7, 22 to 23. Many will say to me in, on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? and driven out demons in your name, and done many mighty works in your name. And then I will say to them openly and publicly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who act wickedly, disregarding my commands. From that opening passage, I want to go back 2,000 years approximately ago. Palestine at that time, which included all of uh, the Israelis, consisted of about two million people. And they were on the very eve of the birth of the Messiah. Rome ruled with a tight fist. Rome was one of the most mightiest power on the earth at that time. And as we looked over Palestine, we would see people, uh, farmers trying to eke out a living, uh, plowing with somewhat primitive plows, trying to get something to grow out of the ground. But then we would look into bustling cities where the Romans had their influence. And there are a lot of good things about the Roman Empire. There were pleasures and things like this. They were great architects, built mighty works, aqueducts, and affected our, our law. In, in religious uh, circles, you would find the Jewish priests offering sacrifices to Jehovah, Yahweh, God. And just a few miles away, you would also find pagan priests offering offerings and sacrifice to the Roman god Jupiter. Most of the Jews at that time in history absolutely despised the Romans. And the Romans had little more regard for the Jewish people. They were basically what they considered to be a cantankerous, rebellious people. The only people that profited from the Roman rule at that time were tax collectors, and in the Herodian class, some of the uh, kings and, and other people in authority, some of the priesthood that profited from the Roman rule. In the time of Moses, God had specifically commanded that the Jewish people keep themselves separate from other nations and peoples. Why was that? Because in the big picture, Satan was trying to destroy the messianic seed. Let me read you the command. In Exodus 34, 11 through 12, it says, Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I drive out before you the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Parasite, I think I'm pronouncing that right, the Hivite, the Jebusite, Take heed to yourself, lest you make a covenant or mutual agreement with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become a snare in the midst of you, lest you listen to Balaam, who was a prophet for profit, P-R-O-F-I-T. He would take money. And we know that he was instrumental in leading 
the Israelites away from God by getting the men to intermarry with women of other pagan tribes. And as I said before, the end result would have been if this thing had continued is that the genealogy of the Messiah, as we see listed in Matthew 1, would be so garbled, so messed up, that it could have possibly permitted the pure seed of, of producing the Messiah. And so because of the disobedience and the sin of the uh, Jewish people, they now find themselves in captivity and having to bow to the will of their captors. Because Palestine at this time in history straddled an important commercial route, it was a military highway and it linked Asia and Africa and Europe by land and sea. Rome considered it to be extremely important, and so they established various garrisons and forts in this whole area. Another aspect of the odious part of the Roman rule is they had taxation. They would tax the Jewish family on what they considered to be the value of their income and the number of people that were in their family and their personal property. And this taxation, we know, brought Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem, to the city of their origin. And Rome also supported puppet kings or governors to rule over the Jewish people and have uh, affect their daily lives in every little tiny area. One of these kings we know very well. He was Herod the Great. Herod was a brilliant man in the sense that he was a great architect, but he was a ruthless king. He was so ruthless that he had no regard for his own family members. He had one of his favorite wives executed because supposedly she and her mother had plotted against him and the mother was also executed. He had three of his own sons executed very shortly before he died, before the angel striking him and him dying, all because he thought they had designs upon his throne. Today we would consider such a man to be a psychopath, but in that day he had the power of life and death. King Herod then hears the possibility of a little baby that was born and that he would be called the king of the Jews. We know the story. In a move to try to stop this little baby from becoming the king of the Jews, he gave an order that his soldiers were to go out and to murder every, every baby boy from two years and down, recorded in Matthew 2.16. This was a fulfillment of prophecy eons ago in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31.15 says, Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping and weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. I want to read you from a historical transcript, a letter that Herod the Great wrote to uh, the Roman Senate, uh, Senate and also to Caesar at that time, defending his action on what he did. This comes out of the Jewish Talmuds and historical documents. I quote, So I saw an insurrection brewing fast and nothing but a most bloody war as a consequence. Now, under these circumstances, what was I to do? In my honest judgment, it was best to pluck the undeveloped flower in its bud and shed its deadly poison over both nations and impoverish and ruin them forever. My enemies can see I could have no malice toward the infants of Bethlehem. I took no delight in listening to the cries of innocent mothers. May all the gods forbid. No, I saw nothing but an insurrection and a bloody war were our doom, and in this overthrow and downfall to some extent of our nation. And I want to tell you something, my friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, the words that are written here will follow that man to the great white throne judgment seat of Christ. Jesus Christ will be the judge one day. And every person that goes into eternity without the blood of Jesus Christ covering them, every deed, every word they say goes with them. 
and they have to answer for every one because they are not covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. So in this political and social environment, our wonderful Jesus was born about 2,000 years ago. He lived, he ministered, and he fulfilled every word and letter of Isaiah chapter 53. And as the sinless Lamb of God, we know that he went to Calvary to die for you and for me. But praise God, death could not hold him. Only three days in that grave, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, God raised him from the dead. Praise the Lord. The scriptures say that to verify his resurrection, over 500 people saw him according to 1 Corinthians 15, 6. And after his ascension back to heaven, he sat down on the right hand of God in 1 Peter 3, 22. And guess what? He's going to sit there until every knee bows and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Praise God. On the day of Pentecost, we had approximately 100, well, we actually had 120 believers, according to the scriptures. They were devoting themselves to prayer in this upper room. When the mighty Holy Spirit of God, God the Holy Ghost, came and filled each one of those 120 believers with his mighty power and with his mighty anointing, and guess what happened? The New Testament church was born at that point in Jesus' name. Now, the interesting part about these 120 people is that they were all Jewish. There was not one Gentile among those 120 people. But in John 3, 16, we say that the scriptures, God so loved the world, that's all mankind, that he gave his only son. And you remember that when Mary and Joseph came to the temple to dedicate baby Jesus, that Simeon, a mighty man of God, held that little baby. And he said in Luke 2.32, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, to disclose what was before unknown and to bring praise and honor and glory to your people, Israel. But how was this to be? One of the biggest questions facing the early church well, they were all Jewish, and they had the question, did Jesus come to earth to become Savior and Lord to only Jews? Did he come to save Gentiles? Remember, they detested the Romans. In Acts 10, 1 and 2, it says this, Now living at Caesarea, there was a man whose name was Cornelius, a centurion, a captain of what was known as as the Italian regiment, a devout man who venerated God and treated him with reverential obedience, as did all his household. And he gave much alms to the people and prayed continually to God. An amazing man. Amazing. Amazing. Amazing that there was such a man at this particular time in history. Herod the Great, talking about Caesarea, had built this city on, on the Mediterranean Sea. They say that the port portion of this city covered over nine miles. It was a city in where the kings lived, where the Roman procurators lived. It was a state-of-the-arts community. It became the capital of Judea, and it was distinguished by beautiful buildings you still can see the picture, I mean, the actual uh, aqueducts that still exist. Some of these aqueducts were as long as six miles long, bringing water into this capital city. Most of the troops that were stationed in Caesarea were Syrian people. They were not Romans. But also there, there were special cohorts or regiments that were composed of volunteer, all-Italian troops that reflected the prestige of the Roman rule. According to Joseph, uh, Joseph, Josephus, there we go, this morning, Josephus was one of our uh, historians, Christian historians. 
He said that Cornelius could have commanded 600 to 1,000 troops. He was a career military officer, part of the mighty Roman Empire, whose gods included Jupiter, and later on they worshipped Caesar. They considered Caesar to be a god. Note that Cornelius was drawn to learn about God from the Jewish people and probably went to synagogue and learned enough from the Old Testament scriptures to practice the virtue of praying as he did, giving alms to the poor and benefiting the Jewish people. Note how he had reverence for God and that reverence uh, spread to every member of his family. That sounds like to me almost like Psalms 112 for the righteous man and how he affects his family. So Cornelius was able to perform all of his military duties as a Roman officer, including interacting with other commanders in the army, and still venerate Jehovah God and seek to follow him with reverent obedience. What an unusual man. In Acts 10, 3 through 4, and about the ninth hour, about 3 p.m. of the day, he, Cornelius, saw clearly in a vision. Now, what is a vision? A vision is not a dream. It's when you're standing here or sitting there, and suddenly God just opens something up to you, and you see it just like a movie. So he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God entering and saying to him, Cornelius. And he, gazing intently at him, became frightened. It might scare me too. And said, What is it, Lord? And the angel said to him, Your prayers and your generous gifts to the poor have come up as a sacrifice to God and have been remembered by him. Let me pose this at you. Pastor, you mean that a person that's a citizen of a 1040 window who has never heard of Jesus Christ, but being born in that culture, that's all he knows, but he knows there's something more. He's reaching out. His, his, his spirit is open, but he doesn't know how to reach out. God sees that heart. He sees the, perhaps the uh, very constrictive restraints in his society that he cannot mention that he has uh, other desires to seek for something beyond what he's commanded to learn in that society. You know what's going to happen to that man? God is going to reach down sovereignly and he's going to reveal Jesus Christ. You know, I was listening to Billy Graham this morning. The pastor that's a, a, a captive, or he is in jail, in prison in Iran for preaching the gospel, had a vision from the Lord at 3 o'clock in the morning that he was to preach the gospel. See, God just reached down sovereignly and spoke to him. Let me tell you something. God is moving sovereignly all over this earth today. He is reaching out. He is reaching out into a prison cell to t some woman that has never heard of Jesus Christ. But he reveals sovereignly that Jesus is real, that he is her Savior. We're seeing reports like that happen all the time. That's the reason why we have to pray for the 1040 window for every nation on this earth. We have got seven nations that uh, it said there's not a single believer in those nations. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying, God, there are some people in there that have not bowed their knee to Baal, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to believe that a church will be formed in that nation. They will become the salt of the earth, the light on the hill that cannot be hid. And we're going to see a witness of the gospel to that nation. In verses 5 and 6 of this 10th chapter, the angel then specifically tells Cornelius, to send messengers. It ended up being two uh, uh, men that were non-military and one of his soldiers to a certain man named Simon whose surname is Peter to a certain address where Peter was staying at another Simon the Tanner's home by the seaside. 
Sounds like to me God knows our thoughts. He knows our, uh, when we sit down and when we rise up. He knows where we live. He knows our telephone number. He sees our emails. He knows all about us. And so he knew exactly where Peter was. And so he gave Peter the exact address of Simon the Tanner. And you know what Cornelius did? He didn't hesitate. He didn't think, oh, this is something in my imagination. It was just uh, something I thought I saw. He obeyed promptly. The importance of this prompt obedience to the angel's command cannot be measured because he was a Gentile. And as the three members of this party that he had sent out were on the way to meet with Peter, guess what? We find Peter up on the rooftop of Simon the Tanner's home, and he was having a time with the Lord. Now, you and I would not think about getting on the top of our house here in Texas. That's the hottest place to be. But in that area of the world, you could be up there with those sea breezes, probably some reed-type uh, shield from the sun, and it was a fairly decent place, cool, and this is a place that was Peter's place to get alone with the Lord. Well, what does that speak to us? We need to have a place to get alone with the Lord. I don't care how crowded you are with your family situation. You need to carve out early if it has to be, and usually it is early, that you're going to, be st uh, uh, that you're going to spend time with your Lord that you're going to read His Word. You're going to get instructions for the day. You're going to commit yourself to the Lord. The Holy Spirit's going to guide you for that day. And as Peter was up there, he could have been fasting. The Scriptures doesn't say. But I know one thing. The Bible says he was very hungry. It was noon. The hamburgers were frying on the grill below. And he could hardly wait till they said, Dinner's ready. But as he was up there on that roof in verses 11 and 12, he sees the sky open and something like a great sheet that began to be lowered by the four corners of the sheet and it was descending to the earth. It contained all kind of quadrupeds and wild beasts and creeping things of the earth and birds of the air. I have to think that there's a big fat pig in there and probably a honey baked ham. Who knows what was in there? But no, I, I don't think it was kind of that way. I think it was kind of lizards and things like that and some rattlesnakes and other things that were in that sheet. But uh, what did Peter do? He drew back from that. He recoiled at the very suggestion, even though he was hearing from heaven, that he would partake of some of those horrible creatures that were in that sheet. But God kept telling him, don't defile and profane what I call to be holy. Three times that happened to Peter. Three times that sheet was lifted down. Eat. Oh, Lord, I can't do that. I can't do that. But Peter had forgotten what Jesus taught him one time when he was here on earth. And this was found in Matthew 15, 18. But whatever comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And this is what makes a man unclean and defiled. I go on another scripture, not what he eats. Isn't that interesting? So why is, so, is it so important for you to bless the food? You need to bless the food in Jesus' name because you never know the hands that have handled that food or you didn't wash it correctly or whatever. But more than that, you are, you're saying, oh, Father, I'm so grateful that you provided another meal for us. I'm grateful for the roof that I have over my head. I'm grateful that my air conditioning unit works. I'm thankful for the cars I drive, the clothes that I wear on my back. So we are thankful at all times to the Lord. But Peter was having this struggle with an issue bigger than the creatures in the great sheet. His struggle was that same underlying heart issue of sharing the news of the gospel with the Gentile. And lo and behold, as Peter was thinking about what he had just seen, a Roman soldier and two other men knock, knock, knock on the front door of Simon's house, asking for an audience with Peter. My memory when I was looking at this passage drifted back to 1955. 
And I remember this, I've shared this with you before, but I can remember this as like it was yesterday. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot and four other wives watched as that tiny airplane took off from that jungle air uh, strip loaded with their husbands and gifts for the Aqua Indian tribe that they were trying to reach for the gospel. They had done a lot of things with a bucket and a rope and all of that, and they thought that they would receive them. Little did they know that their husbands will be killed by the Aquas and their bodies discovered a few days later. But a few months hereafter, the Spirit of God spoke to Elizabeth's heart. He wanted her to go and live with the Aqua Indian tribe and show them his love. You know what Elizabeth did? She took her kids and she lived with the Aqua Indians for about two years. She shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And as they listened to her and saw her little children and how she lived every day with them, that whole Aqua Indian tribe basically accepted Jesus Christ, including the very men that speared her husband to death. That was the love of God. In Acts 10, 19 through 20, and while Peter was earnestly revolving the, mission, the vision in his mind and meditating on it, the Holy Spirit said to him, the Holy Spirit said, you know the Holy Spirit is a person. He was just talking to me a while ago. I've told you before, he uses my nickname, Sonny, when he talks to me. So I know it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Get up and go down and go below and accompany them without any doubt about its legality or any discrimination or any hesitation, for I have sent them. Peter says, Yes, Lord. He immediately goes down. He meets the three messenger, messengers and let me just say right here, when you hear a word from God, do something. Amen. Do something. Don't sit there and wonder, oh, was that God or was that imagination? The devil is not going to tell you to go and share the gospel with somebody. He's not going to tell you to take a meal to a needy neighbor. He's not going to tell you to become a home group leader or be a Sunday school teacher. You know that that is not, it's got to be God. God is trying to tell us something. Now, whether we're to do something specifically, maybe it takes a little while, but God is speaking to us. And in verse 24, so Peter said, okay, here we go. And the following day, they entered Caesarea. It took about up to two days to get to Caesarea from where they were. But Cornelius was waiting for and expecting them, and he had invited together his relatives and his intimate friends. Praise God for such a man. He didn't say, okay, it's just me and you, Peter. He invited everybody, all of his family and all of his immediate friends. And this was a very memorial event, sorry, memorable event, because it was the first invasion of the Roman Empire by Christian soldiers. That's us. And so Cornelius being a Roman officer, threw himself at Cornelius, uh, I mean, at, at Peter's feet. He was going to worship him, and Peter said, no, no, get up. I'm not a god, I'm a mere man. And then Cornelius shares with Peter the vision that he had about someone coming and sharing with him what God had for him, his family, and his friends. When Peter hears this, he clears the air. He says, okay, I've got this thing. God has invited me to come and share the good news of, gospel, of the gospel with you. He is no respecter of persons. See, it takes some time a revelation of God to get some things cleared out of our minds. You know, because of tradition, because we misinterpret the Word of God somehow even, but God, by the Holy Spirit, if you'll remain faithful in seeking Him and being constant in the Word of God, you'll get it straight. Yeah. Praise God. So as, so as Cornelius and everybody listens to Peter as he begins to share the gospel, we know one good thing about Cornelius. 
Would you agree with me this morning that Cornelius was a good man? I would say if I had ever read a story about anybody that was like this person, I would say he was a good man. He was a man that prayed continuously. He was a man that was benevolent in his giving. He had a good attitude toward the Jewish people. And because of that, it drew God's attention from heaven. And with all of this, though, did it save Cornelius? No. Cornelius was not born again. He was still under the law. He was still under, uh, the, as much as he knew, the Old Testament law. The blood of Jesus had not been applied to his life yet. But what was the difference between Cornelius and, say, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, or the Herodians? They were still out there about two or three blocks down the street in the temple offering animal sacrifices and trying to obey the law. Nothing had changed for them. When that, actually the Lamb of God had already come, His blood had been spilt, and they could have had His blood applied to their lives. The curse of the law was lifted off, but they didn't do that. They didn't recognize that. But here was Cornelius, a Gentile, who only knew what he had learned from the, the law and from the Jewish people he had been in contact with, and he was moving in that limited light. And God sought him out and knew that he was not a self-seeker, doing something out of flesh motives. Now let me share this with you today. There is a fuzzy notion that if we do our best, God will be satisfied with us. I've been involved in many funeral services. Sometimes I do not know the person who is deceased. The first thing I will ask the family members is tell me something about this precious loved one who has gone on into eternity. Most of the time, they will tell me that he was a good person. I ask, well, can you tell me a little bit about his spiritual background? Do you know much about that? And many times, the, pam the, pam uh, the family will assure me that they went to church, and uh, sometimes they were baptized as an infant, but... Uh, you know, I get sort of a dull feeling when I hear something like that. And I have the habit once in a while of going through obituaries in the Houston Chronicle when I get it on Sunday. And the reason I do that is that I look for some note of where that person could be spiritually. I know, noticed recently that we had one of our top citizens in Houston uh, die and they had devoted an entire page to all the accomplishments which he did, which I readily agree with. He was a great man, and he did much for our economy. But I still look for, were they active in the church? Uh, usually what you see is where they're going to be buried or where the services are going to be. And that depresses me, and it, it sorrows me because uh, once in a while I'll say, yes, they were active in the church, Brother so-and-so is with the Lord, and you'll see that written out in the obituary. So being a good person just does not get it in God's economy. That's not what he gave the Lord Jesus Christ for and why he came to here on earth. You can be the president of a corporation. You can be a physician who's pioneered great medical research. You can be a wonderful mother a great dad, a benevolent grandparent. How many benevolent grandparents do we have here? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Praise the Lord. An outstanding politician, a person who is champion, as we saw in that little skit, the cause of the poor. Many, many wonderful things in life that, they're, that they have been involved in. But the big question is, did that person have a divine encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 64, 6 reads like this, For we have all become like one who is unclean, ceremoniously, ceremonially, like a leper, and all our righteousness, our best deeds of rightness and justice, is like filthy rags or a polluted garment. We fade like a leaf, 
and our iniquities like the wind take us away far from God's favor, hurrying us toward destruction. Really don't know how short life is till you get up in your golden years and you look back on your life and you say, where did all of those years go? It will shock and stun millions upon millions upon millions of people in eternity when they stand before the great white throne judgment seat of God and they will try to tell God, I did this and I did that. And as I read earlier, I even preached in your name and I did this, these great things in your name. But you know what? There is a stain of sin that came upon every one of us that was born into this world. It happened at the very beginning. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, we inherited a sinful nature. And that sinful nature multiplies and manifests itself at five or six or seven years old, whatever it is in children. Don't do this, and they do it. And they start manifesting that fallen nature. And so children, parents, reach an age of an accountability somewhere along there. That's the reason we need to raise them up, reading the Bible, praying with them, asking them, do they know Jesus Christ? Yes, they're old enough to understand at a certain age. The Lord gave me this example of our goodness compared to God's goodness. An earth, a ball, a steel ball, the size of an earth, size of our earth, that would be intersected every one million years with a feather brushing against it, quadrillion of years down the road in eternity, that steel ball would not be affected hardly at all. That's just a small picture of how somehow our goodness compares to a perfect God. A perfect God that cannot look upon sin they can, he cannot consider one that is covered by sin without seeing that person through the blood of the Lamb. When we go back to the beginning, God accepted Abel's sacrifice, which was the shedding of blood of some of his livestock. But when Cain came and tried to offer God grain offerings, something out of the ground, God did not accept that, and as a result, we had the first murder that ever occurred in history, in Bible history. Men attempt to use church membership, give me something I can do, water, baptizing, uh, water baptism, give me something that I can do, infant uh, baptism, burning of candles, you name it, crawling on your hands and knees for great distances, they're all kind of things that people try to do to show that they are right with God. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For it is by free grace, God's unmerited favor, that you are saved, delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation through your faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves. It is... It's not something that one could pride himself in. It came not through your own striving, but it is a gift of God, not of works, not the fulfillment of the law's demand. Lest any man should boast, we have the tendency to want to boast about what we do. It is not the result of what anybody, anyone can possibly do. So no one can pride himself in it or take glory to himself. God will not accept you taking glory for yourself. The glory has to come to Him, has to come to His Son, has to come to the Holy Spirit of God. Cornelius, I believe, is one of the best examples of how far good works and prayers could go. He needed Jesus Christ. That was not enough. It did not satisfy the requirements where it says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. He needed the precious blood of Jesus to be applied to his life. He needed the, this man called Peter to come to his home, share with him and share with his family, share with his other soldiers and intimate friends what he was preaching, the gospel. Here's something about this new thing. 
In verse 44 it says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all who were listening to the message, and the believers from among the circumcised, the Jewish people that had come with Peter on this evangelistic team, the Jews who came with Peter, were surprised and amazed because the free gift of the Holy Spirit had been bestowed and poured out even on the Gentiles. I've got some great news for you. It affects you and I here this morning. Cornelius, his family and friends became the first Gentile believers recorded in the New Testament. Hallelujah! And that's the reason we're here this morning. Scripture does not record it, but I can imagine that uh, Cornelius became a fireball. I don't know if he saw his 20 or 30 years in the Roman army after that, but I can imagine he was out there witnessing the gospel to everyone that he could find, and that included the army as far as they'd let him. Okay, then we have the question. The title of this message is, Do Good People Go to Heaven? The answer to that is, Good People will never enter the gates of heaven based upon their good works alone. That's the answer to that question. I mean, you can have a lot of good works, but it'll all be burnt up at the end unless the blood of Jesus covers you. I'll give you the answer that Jesus gave us in John 3.3. 3. Some of us know this verse by memory. Jesus answered Cornelius, him. Cornelius was an older man, an expert in the law. So he answered Cornelius, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, that unless a person is born again, anew from above, he can never see, know, be acquainted with, and experience the kingdom of God. Now look, the Holy Spirit told me this, that we cannot become a new creation in Christ Jesus by osmosis. Remember? Remember what we learned in high school? Osmosis going from an area of more density through a membrane into an area of lesser density or diffusion. We can't become born again by thinking our way into the kingdom of God. Did you know that? The scriptures are very clear about that. A lot of folks think that, well, I'll just believe that Jesus is, died 2,000 years ago and I'll think that he is my savior, and that's it. No, the Bible doesn't say that. In Romans 10, 9, and 10, it says, because if you acknowledge and confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and in your heart believe, adhere to, trust in, and rely on the truth that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So there, there is a confession. There is an acting out what you're believing in your heart. Then it goes on to say, for with the heart a person believes, adheres to, trusts in, and relies on Christ, and so is justified, declared righteous, acceptable to God. For with the mouth he confesses and declares openly, and speaks out freely his faith and confirms his salvation. Now I remember here I go again, John, like John Osteen, when I was born again, and when I was 11 years old, I knew that I was lost. I knew that, I, that at 11 years old that I was a sinner, and I used to pray, and all my, now lay me down to sleep at night, God save me. I don't know how, but please save me. And one morning at Calvary Baptist Church in 1948, January the 16th, the Sunday school teacher said, any of you boys will accept Jesus. A few of us raised our hands, praise God. I don't know what happened to the other boy. He's probably in heaven today. But praise God, that's almost 64 years ago. And I know when I was born again. But you know what? I wouldn't have gotten anywhere unless I did what I did a few minutes later. When that pastor got through preaching that message, he said, any of y'all want to receive Jesus this morning? I got out of my seat, went down that aisle, and I said, Pastor, I want to accept Jesus Christ. See, I had to confess. I had to do something. I had to get out of my comfort zone. I had to do what the Word of God says. So let's everyone stand this morning. Praise the Lord. Yes. 
You know, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit gave this message for a very important reason. I think that there's some of us here this morning, I do not know everyone, but I believe that some of us have never had the experience of having Jesus Christ come into our life and transforming us. Let me tell you exactly what happens. When you do that this morning, the Holy One of God, the Holy Spirit of God, will actually enter your spirit and there will be a sealing of your spirit. And you will know that you know that something has happened to your heart, that you've been changed. Something that you don't know exactly, but it's something that's wonderful. That's what God wants you to do this morning. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ, this is your day. And let me just read another scripture to you. It says in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Therefore, everyone who acknowledges me before men and confesses me out of a state of oneness with me, I will acknowledge him before my Father who is in heaven and confess that I am abiding with him. But whoever denies and disowns me before men, I will also deny and disown him before my Father who is in heaven. So this is your day. This is your day to step out. As Don starts playing some music, I'm just inviting every one of you, if it's a child, I don't care how old you are, little child, if you have a tug on your heart that you want to ask Jesus into your heart, this is your day to come forward and accept Jesus. Some of you perhaps have gone down to make a decision in the past, but you feel like nothing has happened in your life. This is your day. Let's come down and get this straightened out this morning. So I want to invite you to come. Those who do not know for sure that they've been born again, those who want to ask Jesus Christ into their heart, I ask you to come down in Jesus' name. Old grandmothers, granddads, younger, you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, but you want to do that today. You want to make sure that you're born again. You want to make sure that you're right with God. Everyone that needs the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God for this young man. But I know there are others. I know there are others. I know there are others. Praise God. I know there are others here. There are others here. I know by the Spirit of God that there's others here that need Jesus Christ. Praise God for this, sister. There are others here. There's others here. This is a day of di divine intersection between God and you. God wants to do a miracle work in your life. Thank you, sister. Anyone else that wants to come forward, accept the Lord Jesus Christ. This is your day. This is your day. Teenagers, I don't know if you're all born again, but if you've never asked Jesus Christ, you want to do it now. You want to do it now before you get into college. You want to do it now so God can put his hand on your life and tell you exactly what he wants you to become in life. In Jesus' name. All right, praise God. We're not going to prolong this. We're not going to prolong this. If you have any doubts, see, all heaven is looking. Did you know that? The heavens are open. There are witnesses that have gone on before us. The angels are watching this. The angels are watching this. God the Father is observing. Jesus is observing at the right hand of the Father. He knows every one of our hearts. There is nothing hidden from Him. He knows every thought. He knows everything you've done in life. He knows if your heart has not been changed. He's watching. This is your opportunity to receive Him and confess Him before men. Praise the Lord. Anyone else that wants to come forward this morning? Anyone else? Praise God. All right, we're not going to prolong this. We just thank God. Everybody get Jesus a hand, would you? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Here's another. Let's give the Lord a hand. Another. Praise God. Actually, Actually, we're not going to close the invitation if even after we dismiss. If you still want to come down, we're here to show you how the Lord will become your Savior this morning. But we thank God for what He's doing. I just want to say this to each one here that came down. When we have water baptism, we expect you to be water baptized in our presence, confess the Lord, 
afresh and say, look, here I am. I'm going under the waters just like Jesus went into the grave. I'm coming out of the waters to testify to this church that I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior on the 18th of August, 2013. Praise the Lord. All right. Okay. All right. So if anyone else wants to come, we're down here to receive you this morning. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Holy Spirit, we love you. We appreciate your presence so much. You fill us with your holy person. You talk to us. You lead us. You guide us. You confirm that we are one in Christ Jesus. We're God's children through our Lord. And I just thank you for everyone that's come forward this morning. If there's anyone out there, I pray, Holy Spirit, that they'll not leave this place today without getting things straight with you through Jesus Christ. And I praise you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day. Praise the Lord. Just as I